Good evening. I am Philip Bump. I'm the National Correspondent for the Washington Post. Uh, I'm going to be your moderator for this evening's panel, uh, which is titled The Future of Political Violence in the United States. Uh, so before I introduce the panelists, I just want to let folks know what I'm hoping to do here is really get a sense from a layperson's perspective of what political violence looks like at this point in the United States, what we can expect it to look like moving forward uh, from four people who spent a lot of time analyzing this, assessing it, and understanding exactly how political violence unfolds. Uh, so our panel for this evening uh, is Shana Gadarian uh, from Syracuse University, whose name I knew I was going to trip over and should have practiced more beforehand. Uh, Omar Garcia Ponce from uh, George Washington University, Joseph Young from American University, and Thomas Eitzoff from American University. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just start by asking questions. Uh, we'll ask the panelists the questions. At the end, there will be time for people in the audience to ask questions as well. So if you have a question, feel free to add to the chat and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, so we'll start with you, uh, Shana, and obviously any other panelists who have thoughts, feel free to weigh in. Uh, but one of the things I'm curious, obviously the most prominent example of political violence in the United States in recent history, much less uh, in the past 12, to 14 months was the attack at the Capitol on January 6th. And so what I'm curious is if you could describe anything that you saw in the days leading up to that, weeks leading up to that, which suggested or hinted that something like that might be uh, uh, might be coming up. Sure, um, that's a great question. And I, I want to be clear that I actually didn't anticipate violence. And I'm not sure that many people like, I study American politics and public opinion um, I study polarization, and so I knew that there, there was clearly a response that was differing across the public in terms of their acceptance of the outcome of the election. Um, and what we know about how people form their opinions about um, most issues in American politics is they look to the elites of the parties that they affiliate with for signals about how to understand complicated events. And so one of the things we saw very clearly after the election was very different messages from Joe Biden and Democrats and Republicans, not just Trump, but Republicans across the country feeding into what we now call the big lie, right? Which is that there was massive voter fraud and the only way Trump could have lost was whether it, if there had been fraud, that there was no legitimate way for Biden to have won. And because that, um, that kind of sprinkling of signals from the Republican Party was not overtly challenged um, by other Republicans in the party, it kind of took a life of its own. And so that kind of idea, this big lie, starts to become the belief system of people who affiliate with the Republican Party. Not all of them, but you know that's how the idea that the election was stolen undercuts everything that we believe about democracy, which is that our votes matter, that they count, and that they should determine the winner. And if so, if you have this belief that your vote was stolen by an illegitimate um, figure in Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, that would make you really angry. And anger can motivate you to turn out and use violence um, against others. Now, again, you know, a lot of what we saw, you know, the, the capital insurrection was a lot of people, but that's not most voters, right? So I think the real question, and I'd be interested in hearing from the other panelists who study this, is what differentiates the people who are motivated enough to go to the Capitol from those who are just merely angry and believing that there was this kind of stole, you know, this election was stolen from them? Well, I mean, it even seems like there's several tiers there. I mean, first you have to be motivated to go to D.C. Then you have to be motivated to go from D, you know, from the ellipse to the to the Capitol, for example. So, did, did any of the other panelists? Did any of you say, "Hey, I'm really worried about what's going to be happening here on January 6th? I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I'll I'll say is like I did not see it coming to the extent that it was. I mean, um, I think you know it's similar to Shana's that I saw, you know there was this, you know, and I think this is the interesting part of it. There was this grassroots movement that you had like folks in Arizona and other things holding these rallies. Um, and you had folks like Paul Gosser kind of fringe people holding the rallies. And honestly, like if it was just Paul Gosser and, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and like the fringy wing of the Republican Party, I don't think it would have been as big as it was. But the big thing is that the leader of the Republican Party, President Trump, picked up on it, amplified it, held a rally for it. And I think that's probably, I think, what made it more than it would have been had he not. Um, and then as to why, you know, the question about like why 
people did what they did, why we saw the violence and the insurrection, right? I think there was a lot of mixed motives. I mean, clearly there were some people who were there for bad news. I mean, people with zip ties, masks, weapons, then you had other people kind of MAGA tourists. And I think that's one of the things that happened. There were mixed motivations for what people did, why they did. It wasn't this like cohesive, everybody was there to hunt members of Congress, but there were clearly were some people who were there for that. So Omar, I'd ask you, does it seem as though the country now is at higher or lower risk for political violence than it was at the beginning of the Biden administration? I guess my initial reaction would be that today there is a lower risk of, of escalating political violence. But I would like to, um, to step back a little bit and, and react um, or to share a couple of reactions with respect to this idea that uh, the US is experiencing a democratic backsliding and is mm -hmm. heading towards a scenario of escalating political violence and potentially a civil war. I share many of the concerns in terms of the threats to democracy and the escalation of political violence. Uh, but um, in our conversation, I would like to push back a little bit on this narrative, not necessarily because I feel more optimistic, but because uh, I believe that the challenges that democracy is facing, not only in the United States, but across the world, even in other well-established or uh, mature democracies, uh, illustrate very well in my view uh, that democracy has a sort of cyclical relationship uh, with, with violence. And there is this narrative that democracy is experiencing a process of erosion in the US. Um, to some extent, I don't agree with this narrative because we often think of nations like the US and many other uh, Western European countries as mature democracies with uh, centuries old democratic stability and peace. Uh, but if we think about this in historical terms, like universal suffrage, for example, was achieved in the, in the first half of the 20th century for most democracies. And in several Latin American countries until the 60s or in the 70s. And I would go even further and say that um, I wouldn't consider the US a fully institutionalized liberal democracy uh, before the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that we are po possibly experiencing uh, both the erosion of certain features of democratic regime, which led to what happened uh, last year, and at the same time, uh, probably a, a profound transformation of democracy like for, for large parts of the population, there's been historically enormous barriers in terms of having a voice in uh, demo, the democratic conversation of, the, of this country. So I believe that more than a, an erosion or a demolition of democracy, we might be experiencing a deep transformation of democratic institutions. Uh, many of these institutions we, which were elite dominated and now uh, are struggling to incorporate and give voice to previously marginalized individuals. So from, from, from this perspective, uh, I think my, my impression is that the political violence can escalate in, in the absence of a democratic dialogue that gives room to, to diversity and accepts uh, political dissent. Um, but, um, but yeah, so um, the short answer is uh, that um, I don't see a scenario of escalating violence in the, near, in the, in the, in the short term. I so, think of this more as a cyclical relationship between democracy and violence throughout the history of the United States. If we look at the data on political violence trends for the US, we will see this huge wave in the 60s and the 70s um, for all types of violence, political violence, homicidal violence, and then a decline. We are experiencing a resurgence today of uh, political violence, but I, I think it, it's part of a broader historical uh, development. So, so part of what you're saying, it, correct me if this is not an accurate paraphrase, but to some extent you're also saying that the idea that America is backsliding democratically is, is incorrect, not because there's not a backsliding, but because America is not as far along as people like to think it was. Is that is that an accurate paraphrase of part of what you're saying there? I'd say that, for example, during the administration of Donald Trump, there were certainly uh, big hits to the... Right, okay. That I would some of the... Uh, democratic features of our uh, regime. But in the, let's say in the bigger picture, yes, I, I, I believe that uh, 
uh, we are experiencing uh, a profound transformation of deepening the democrat, democrat uh, the democracy of this country, um, which I believe happens also in, in, in many other countries. I, I would just want to push back a little bit just because I think our, you know, a very simple definition of democracy is that all parties in the system agree to lose. And this is sort of unique, I think, right now in the US that we have a one party that refuses to lose. And I think that has profound implications for us potentially backsliding. I don't disagree that that it could be cyclical and, and um, with some of the other things that, that Omar said. But I do think that when you have one side saying we can't lose an election and challenges the legitimacy of that sort of democratic equilibrium that we're in, that's really troubling. And that's sort of the basis for the backsliding we saw in Venezuela and Hungary and some of the other countries um, that you didn't necessarily see political violence being the cause of this deterioration is more that one party saying, no, we're not going to legitimately lose. We're not going to let ourselves lose again. So I just want to pick up on one theme that Omar mentioned, and I think is worth kind of putting in the background of the conversation is that um, we've seen political violence in the past at upholding white supremacy. And so a lot, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that our kind of full democracy, right, comes, as he says, in the 1960s, where we, we get actual full voting rights, and, and those are under attack as well for Black Americans. Um, and so a lot of the, the previous violence we've seen is not simply for one party to keep in power, it's for kind of, to keep up the institutions of white supremacy. And so I do think that that's a kind of another theme we see in American politics is when violence is used, it's not always for partisan gain. Um, it is in part to keep a, a racial hierarchy. And so I, I do think that's another you know, complicating factor in, in thinking about you know, when, vi when we see violence in the US. Can I just, there, oh, please. Sorry, I just want one, one thing to sort of piggyback is that I also think you asked about like, you know, is the country at a higher or lower risk right. um, for violence? And I think maybe in the short term, right, that if, you know, I'm not going to, you know, put on my epidemiology hat, which I, I don't have, but like if COVID, you know, starts to recede, I think many of, you know, we might be at kind of a lower risk for violence. Because I also think, you know, Shana is writing an amazing book with co-authors on this, right, in pandemic politics, right, mm -hmm. that if you were to design like a social stress device, right, the COVID pandemic was kind of the perfect sort of social stress device. You had schools closed, we've lost over a million people, you had businesses close, you had, you know, in the midst of an intense political campaign, right, not saying all those things are going away. But if, you know, schools start to stay open, and some of those other institutions that were closed, right, you might see a kind of lessening of some of the stress in the short term. But that's not to say the long term effects of, you know, I don't think the Republican Party has, quote, unquote, moderated in the post Trump era, right, I think it's retrenched. And that goes back to what Shana was saying about, and Omar about, are we going to allow people who were previously disenfranchised and have become newly enfranchised to have a voice in the system? And I think that's one of the biggest questions. So, Thomas, Omar had mentioned the, the spate of violence that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s, which uh, a lot of that was actually, at the time, left wing violence that we saw, the Weather Underground organizations like that. I'm curious how you see political violence these days as being akin to or different from that sort of violence and what we learned. How did that abate? What was it about that period, which was obviously far more consistently violent than we've seen of late? What changed to have that end? And how is that, how is that similar or different from what we see these days? Oof, big question. Big question. Um, I mean, <laughs> I have, have an you hour. Know, Go nuts. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of like potential answers. I mean, in, in like, you know, my colleagues in, you know, my department who are criminologists, I mean, we still don't have a good total explanation for why crime declined in the 90s, right? And this was, that was a period, right, in the late, you know, the 60s and 70s where we start seeing a massive uptick in homicides in the US and then continuing pretty much through the mid 90s, right? And that was like one side effect of, of this period, right? There were, you know, 
riots. There were some people refer to it as, you know, the black insurgency, if you're Doug McAdams, like pushing back against this racial hierarchy, right? And I think a lot of that was more, you know, one big difference is that was more bottom up. There were political leaders, but there wasn't a political party that was giving voice and cover to those. And I think that's one of the things that gives people pause nowadays is that there is definitely more acceptance, um, you know, particularly within parts of the Republican party, especially in a post-Trump era of the acceptability of kind of the politics of menace, the politics of threat. And that I think is something that is different um, from then. I think it's the role of elites is the big difference. With just that very, very quickly that, um... Well, another difference is that um, more than left-wing violence, I would say it was uh, repressive violence, right? So there were left-wing social movements that were being repressed. And I think that today we face a very different situation in, in that regard. Uh, I think state, I mean, this, the American state during the 60s and 70s was uh, much more repressive than what we observed during the current administration. Yeah, and I, I agree with both what Omar and, and Thomas said, and I, I would add one other big difference uh, between what we saw in the 60s and today is the role of information. And, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s, we had essentially one source of information, or at least I mean, we could say three channels. But if people wanted to know what was going on in the Vietnam War, they turned on the TV news and they listened to Walter Cronkite. Today, we're in this really bifurcated or, or, you know, really diverse news situation where we aren't consuming the same amounts of information. And I think that's really affecting us in the sense that, you know, if you're just watching CNN to get your information about Charlottesville versus you're just watching Fox News, you're getting totally different stories and then making different um, inferences about what should be done. Yeah, I had actually, after that, I'd written Fox at the bottom of this piece of paper because I wanted to ask about that. There's this quote from John Dean that really stuck out to me. I don't remember where it was exactly, but at the beginning of the Trump administration, he said, it, had there been a Fox News during the Nixon administration, Nixon would not have had to have resigned. And so, you know, one of the things that I think perpetually strikes me, I write about politics day in, day out for my job, is the extent to which these this siloing occurs. And we have folks like Tucker Carlson who are out there, you know, not explicitly advocating advocating for political violence, but certainly rationalizing, you know, both specific incidents of political violence and broadly the, the, this undercurrents. I mean, to what extent, I mean, obviously that is something that is differentiating here, but to what extent is that actually problematic, you know, j beyond just the layperson's, hey, that, that's not good, you know, is this, is this something, this sort of information structure, something that we've seen elsewhere uh, that is indicative of, of bigger problems? Dana, or, uh, I, I, or Shane, I'd ask you to, to answer that. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so my normal answer to this kind of question about Fox News is that I am usually more worried about people who don't pay attention to politics at mm. all. Um, that there are a lot of people who pay very little attention. And so where they're getting their information is on Facebook or through conversations. Um, but I do think when we're talking about those people who are most motivated, who might be the most likely to use violence or who are kind of more concerned about, you know, what they see as kind of the kind of downfall of the country that they were, um, that they once believed in, um, we're talking more about people who are, um, I think it, their, their information not necessarily from the news, but their information in their social networks is pretty homogenous. And so I think it's, I think the, the mass media matters quite a bit in terms of setting the agenda and the framing of, the, and of how to understand what's going on in politics. But I also think this kind of, um, this isolation that, the social isolation that we have um, that is increasingly polarized by party um, becomes more of an issue because those folks who don't pay attention, they're getting their messages from people who are very embedded in, um, in politics. And so those messages get to them. And then, you know, the kind of messages that people are getting, the kind of highly informed people are just talking to each other also. And so I, I do think that this information environment has a, a variety of challenges for trying to get a shared view of reality um, that comes not just from the kind of bifurcation of the media, but also the way that our social isolation has increased in the last decade or so and hasn't and wasn't helped at all by the pandemic, as Thomas said. And I, 
uh, just add one quick thing. Um, like, so like Michael Bang Peterson, he's an amazing scholar, like um, uh, from Denmark. And he like had this uh, tweet thread that I always thought was really good about like with his testimony that he gave, because um, he's one of the people who studied, I think, social media a ton. Um, and I've studied a little bit too as well. And it's similar to kind of my feelings on this is that like, I think there's a very big temptation to say like, Fox News did it or social media did it in like, you know, clue in terms of who's to blame, who, you know, who killed, you know, democracy. We've already, you know, accepted that that premise maybe isn't as um, correct as, as some people would argue. Um, but I think social media also gives us this window into a very angry, politically kind of motivated part of society. And sometimes, you know, that can jump to mainstream media. And I think Trump was very effective at doing that. Um, you know, but it, I think at the end of the day, right, it, our media also reflects kind of the offline cleavages of elites, right? And that's, I think, a really important. I'll caveat this saying, I don't know what the effect of TikTok on politics is, but I'm guessing it's like way scarier <laughs> than we know yet. Um, that does tend to be the pattern. So, but Joseph, I mean, the thing that strikes me about this conversation, of course, and this, you know, perhaps I'm wrong, but isn't it also the case that when we're talking about something like social media, the, the, the example that I like to use of how the internet can bring groups together is, is furries, or these people who like to you know, dress up as animals. And you know this, this happened apparently for decades before the internet, but then the internet merged and they found they could build an entire community and have conferences because there are so many people that share this, this affinity, right? So it's a small group of people, but they're brought together by the internet and, and empowered by the internet to act, to act collectively. And so while it is the case that most people don't watch Fox News, even though millions do. And while it is the case, most people aren't Twitter, God bless them. There are lots of people who are on Twitter and tracking the conversation that way. Isn't it the case, Joseph, that we also, when we're talking about political violence, we're not talking about movements of 50 million people acting violently. We're talking about small subsets of that. And are we at a more disadvantaged position now relative to the information ecosystem, simply because it is so much easier for those groups to find each other? Uh, I'm always split on this one. I, I don't, maybe don't have a good answer to this, but the you know, again, thinking about this kind of violence historically, we've always had violent groups and we've always had violent groups that found each other. And even, I mean, one of the things we know about the far right in the US, they, they were sort of early adopters of lots of this technology. And, you know, they've been doing this. I, I don't know if anybody, I won't say the name of the website, but there's a very famous website that's been around since the 80s, which is still, uh, you know, looks like an old GeoCities website. And I, I'm just not, I guess I'm not sure of the direction of causality uh, and not sure whether it's these new technologies creating anything or if it's uh, these actors who already had this predisposition and already did these things and just finding sort of easier ways to communicate in the same way, you know, sometimes people talk about social media being this big thing that produces uh, protests or something. We've had protests well, well before we had social media. Um, but I do think it sort of helps with the speed of it. I'm, but I, I'd be interested to hear other people's take on it because I guess mine's a little bit more of a um, poo-pooing of it. I think poo-pooing is popular. <laughs> Sorry. No, please. Uh, uh, you was, yeah, yeah, just to, going to jump in very quickly. I, I also agree. It's a, a very, very interesting question, a very difficult one to answer, I believe, because we can find um, you know, theoretical arguments in both directions, right? So on one extent, on one hand, we could we can see why social media uh, facilitates mobilization and encourages uh, actions, um, but we don't know whether those materialize into actual mobilization in the streets, for example, or whether they remain uh, in a chat. Uh, and at the same time, um, we, we know that, that yeah, people uh, mobilize and uh, people build networks uh, through a number of social media uh, channels and that they do have a powerful voice and they do have influence on electoral returns in this country and in probably in many others. And it's an increasing um, um, media of, of, of being exposed not only to uh, networking, but also to a lot of misinformation and to uh, a way also to uh, spread this misinformation that eventually could translate into actual political behavior or mobilization. Uh, but I think we still don't have a lot of uh, empirical evidence uh, 
on where, I mean, I assume that there is a lot of heterogeneity in this, and there will be cases in which social media is contributing and influencing uh, politics uh, very, very heavily, and there are other cases in which it doesn't materialize in political behavior beyond what is expressed in the actual uh, social media. I want to I want to continue on this for a second, just because I want I want to play the outsider and devil's advocate here. Um, and, and Shana and Thomas, I'd, I'd ask for your thoughts here. So in the 1980s, there was this satanic panic about you know kids being wooed by Satan. There were these you know ideas that the satanic groups were molesting kids and things along those lines. I don't know, and perhaps I'm just not remembering it, but it did not it did not manifest in the same way that QAnon did, right? So we had then. When Pizzagate then became QAnon in 2016 and, and, and on, we had multiple incidents in which people who were adherents of QAnon, which is an entirely online thing, had engaged in violence. There was a guy who murdered a mob boss in Staten Island. There was a guy who took over, I think it was the Hoover Dam, like blocked the Hoover Dam. There was, of course, the shooting at Pizzagate. You know, there were QAnon adherents at, at the Capitol on January 6th. So am, am I incorrect in saying that that is something and again, this is N equals one, I get it. Like, you know, this QAnon is an unusual thing. There are not happily a lot of QAnons out there, but am I incorrect in saying that QAnon would not have happened the way it did had it not been able to be built upon social networks in the way that it was? Shane or Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what Joe and Omar's point is, I think is that we, there is a subset of people who have, views that are out of like the political norm, right? right? And under many, many situations, they can find each other. And what the internet does is just speeds that up, right? Um, and that I do think this question about it, you, QAnon is, is not only people who have kind of right of center views, it's like their adherence to a conspiracy theory. And I do actually think one of the really interesting sets of questions in the last decade is like why people, why the increased belief in conspiracy theories, um, what is that psychologically doing for people? Um, who, who are those po folks? And those, and I think conspiracy theories are, are somewhat easier to spread in, on social media on, and than they would be in a, a media environment where it's really, where there's more gatekeeping. So I do think that kind of conspiracy theorists um, may be easier to find each other and kind of radicalize online um, in ways that would be harder if they're spread all over the country. Um, but I think the, the tendency of people to feel left out of politics that and, and who, who are out of the mainstream, that's not new. I think the kind of idea that there's so little gatekeeping that happens online, so little moderation on some of these sites that um, the kind of conspiracy theory part of it is allowed to grow. Um, and that, um, you know, the, kind, the advocation for violence can, can go unchecked for a long time. So I think, you know, every, I think a lot of the points that have been made here are, are really good and you know, I, I don't really disagree with any of them. I would add like maybe one answer um, to this. And of course you had to use satanic panic as, you know, give us the Gen X the, the crazy uh, one. But no, uh, I think um, one of the things too, right, is there's a book, Zinab Tufiki, you know, Twitter to tear gas and arguing about the power of kind of social media for collective action. And I think there's this you know, feeling that, you know, it used to be to subscribe to a conspiratorial kind of web, you know, conspiracy, you had to get, you know, the magazine, you had to subscribe to like the newsletter, right? It was costly. And as Shane and others have pointed out, it, it's not these days. And so you have these more kind of shallow based movements. And that's one of the things that's in up to Fiki talked about, like, it's good, right? We were able to, you know, like, if you think about collective action, there were a ton of people who were able to get out to the women's march. But in previous years, you, you know, you might have had to have the grassroots organizing all these other things. Um, and, you know, you might have had to have like a more cohesive kind of, you know, broad based grassroots movement. And I think this is true with conspiracies as well as that, you know, now with social media and kind of the speed and access, you can kind of have a choose your own adventure um, sort of story. And it's a much more kind of shallow, you know, people feel friendly with people, but it's like, how friendly are you with people who are, 
you know, you're friends with online, you can be friendly with them, but it's not as costly as maybe having those off offline things. And then finally, I think the conspiracy thing, and I think this kind of is like undergirding throughout a lot of our discussion is like trust in institutions across society is just cratered like across time. And I think that's a big part of it, right? You just have this massive drop. I mean, like I remember looking back and being like, oh my gosh, look at the old Gallup polls, how much people trusted Congress. Like, <laughs> what was that about, right? And I think that has a tremendous effect on our politics. So I think there's been like this, you know, people will call it populism or whatever, but like, you know, we have the left right spectrum and then like kind of underlying that there's this like essentially, you know, sort of anti-establishment distrust, you know, dimension. And I think that's related to conspiracy theories, to like acceptance of violence. There's some evidence about all these sorts of things. So I think they're all tied together as well. Yeah, and I, and I think that plays into the anti-elitism, which obviously is something that Trump has fed off of and we, and we see a lot in these other, you know, manifesting in a lot of these other movements as well. Uh, and it's a, good, it's a good segue. Omar, I would ask you, the, what we're seeing in the United States now, things like this deterioration in confidence in institutions, some of the other triggers which people are looking at as potentially indicating an increase in political violence. Are these things, do we have guideposts? Are these things that have occurred elsewhere? Are these things that, that we can look and say, hey, America is, I mean, every time anything happened in the Trump administration, someone was going to write an essay for the Washington Post about how this mirrored, you know, Weimar, the Weimar Republic or, you know, something, right? There's always someone who's going to make some sort of analogy. Are there, though, good analogies for where the United States is that can inform where the United States might be going? Sorry, I Omar, I was asking that, please. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's actually very difficult to find a good analogy for what we are experiencing in the United States. Uh, it's a very exceptional, exceptional case, as it happens with um, many other uh, issues in, in this country. Uh, the levels of violence that we experience in, in the United States are um, significantly higher than what we observe in the rest of the industrialized world, for example. And, um, and it's, I find it a little difficult to situate where, where the United States lies, whether we should be looking at analogies within the developing world, like in, among low middle income countries, that, for example, transition from democracy to autocracy or the other way around, and in that transition experience uh, outbreaks of violence that lead to a civil war, or whether we should be looking at the US as uh, the rest of the mature democracies in the world, like mostly Western Europe, where high levels of income per capita to a large extent represent a very high opportunity cost of engaging, engaging in or organized violence for individuals, which uh, makes it um, very unlikely to experience a conflict of civil war proportions. Um, so I, I, I honestly find it uh, very difficult to find an analogy. I don't think the, 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 we can uh, look at the US um, in the same way that we look at what we, uh, at the outbreaks of civil war for example, or other uh, violent conflicts in, in, in the rest of, of, of the world, which happens mostly in, in, in developing countries. I'm, I'm talking specifically about, about civil wars, but I don't know whether the others have probably a good uh, analogy, uh, contemporary or historical. I, I, well, I, I think I agree with you, Omar, that it's, it, we're in a weird space to compare uh, anyone directly, but I think um, comparing Trump to other um, leaders we see around the world is pretty straightforward. I mean, he's, there's nothing exceptional about him. He's sort of a garden variety right wing populist, um, you know, that's trying to eschew any sort of institutional thing and be anti elite and gin up a, a really targeted piece of his base and, you know, threaten um, minorities and all sorts of things. And in Brazil, you know, their, their president is the same guy as Trump, just speaks a different language and um you know the president in hungary is the same guy they're they're all cut from the same cloth now i i, I don't know what that means ultimately because these are different contexts and so that's where i agree with omar is that it's hard to say then well what what does that mean in terms of how then the u.s goes goes along especially if you know if he were still in power but um yeah i mean the other thing that's exceptional about the united states is is the number of guns per person, right? Which actually makes it more likely that you'll experience violence, even if it's not 
political violence, right? So, you know, the kind of interpersonal violence, school shootings, um, we as a society tolerate a lot of violence in our society because we are not willing to make policy changes that would make kids safer in school, for instance. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure that that correlates that we're, we're heading toward a civil war, but it is unusual for a, a high income society, small D democracy to accept the amount of death um, and violence that the US does. Can I just add, so one thing also um, for folks in the, who have asked that, uh, we're gonna answer questions towards the end. So thank you for the questions so far. I just wanna make sure you know that they're there and we, we will get to those um, towards the end. Um, I totally, you know, I agree with what my colleagues have said. Like, I mean, you can make some arguments about, you know, reconstruction era and kind of retrenchment of like one party rule in some of the states but then you know there was nothing like you know and i think the unique part about the us is we have a lot of guns um we have a high rate of you know homicide compared to most other countries right but we also have an incredibly strong state apparatus so a lot of people when they're telling about like a civil war is you know around the corner or other things you you need to tell me a story about how the fbi you know, all of our different homeland security agencies are totally cool with, you know, fighting on a civil war and allowing that to happen. I think that's unlikely. That doesn't mean that there's not, you know, a lot of, you know, as we've seen to our neighbors to the north with what happened in Ottawa, there are a lot of different, you know, flavors that political violence can take, right? You know, just because you're not in a civil war doesn't mean, you know, there's not a ton of violence and a lot of contention. Um, so I think, you know, and I think this also goes back to our point is that, you know, most people, I think one thing I would say is most people, even partisans abhor violence. They do not like political violence. Like survey after survey shows that if a survey is not showing it, you know, I would say there's some evidence potentially that the survey, you asked it wrong, but right, just because it's not that a lot of people support violence, right, doesn't mean that there isn't a minority that is maybe okay with it. And that minority can cause a ton of problems, especially if they have guns, especially if they're running for office, all sorts of other things. So there's all these sort of little paradoxes that make it less straightforward to say, here's what's going to happen in the U.S. Here's the best comparison case. Yeah, I, I want to just um, add on to what Omar and Thomas are saying, which is we've never seen a civil war in a country that has above a 6,000 per capita GDP. So I, I think talk of civil war in our country is way overblown. Um, and that doesn't mean there isn't other kinds of violence, and we've been talking about that other kinds of violence, but for, for most scholars and most practitioners, a civil war has to have, like what Thomas is saying, you have to have the state doing violent stuff, you have to have rebels doing violent stuff, and you it has to be somewhat sustained, and there are no rebels in the U.S. who could sustain the force of the U.S. government. Uh, you can't imagine the Proud Boys or Oath Keepers or those people meeting um, you know, our military in, in a pitched battle or even in an insurgency. And so it just the the thought that we might be in a civil war is just is kind of uh, I don't I don't see it as a possibility. I do think one of the things that was maybe most jarring to maybe everyday people is to think about the number of law enforcement who might look the other way toward political violence. Um, right, like that's the story in Canada, right? They kind of just let the truckers do their thing for a while. And it was, they couldn't, not that the government couldn't coordinate, but like street level bureaucrats, you know, the police are like, yeah, you're fine, right? Um, and so I think, and you know, one of the, the kind of narratives coming out of January 6th is how many of the rioters were former military or who are former police or former law enforcement. And so I think that's something I agree that the idea of civil war is overblown. But I do think we want to think about small numbers of people who are heavily armed and have been trained by military and law enforcement who might be part of these groups that are, if not challenging government, at least making a real problem for um, you know, continued peace and security. So, so yeah. Shana, let me let me let me follow up with you on that. So it's we're talking about a very wide spectrum here, right? From what happened in Ottawa, which I, you know, coming as an outside observer, would not have thought to categorize as political violence, just because it didn't seem to have a lot of manifestations of what I would you know, think constitutes violence. But we're starting from there to, you know, a full civil war. So, so there are two questions then. The first is, how do you bound the term political violence? What do you see as, as 
constituting political violence. And then the question for all of you, which I think is sort of the core question of this conversation is, where do you think on the spectrum the United States is gonna land over the intermediate term in terms of the sorts of political violence we expect to see? So let's come back to that second question, but but to the first question, like what, what does, how, where is the spectrum start and end? How do you define political violence, Shannon? So that's actually not a question for me. That's a question for all these other comparativeness. Okay, sure, <laughs> no, but no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's use of force against civilians by non-government agents is, I mean, maybe my comparative and IR colleagues want to use a different term, but I think the idea is that it's, it's civilians who are, are using um, force and, and they don't have the legitimacy of the government. Got it. Got it. Can I, can I also just add like on the definition, like is like, I always tell my students it's the use of threats or force to challenge or maintain uh, the status, the political status quo. So it can be both the government doing it or people challenging it. And I think, you know, your point about what was going on in Ottawa, I think is like a really good example because, you know, they're parking those big rigs and like under, you're not going to move us. And we're also going to like, you know, there was some, you know, some questions about menacing behind it. Right. right? So I think, you know, there was, you know, civil war is like, you know, not, it's not a linear process, but usually we see, and, you know, Joe can talk about, he's written a ton on this, is that we see all sorts of different types of violence in the kind of lead up. It's not just civil war happened, right? It's, we see assassinations, violent riots, we see um, clash, street clashes, all these other things that happen. And it's all kind of under this banner of contentious politics, which is politics that happens outside of voting, signing petitions, right? congressional lobbying, sort of the normal course of politics. Um, I, sorry. Go ahead, Omar. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, so I, I fully agree with uh, Thomas and Shana. I think that's a very good definition of uh, political violence. And just wanted to mention that, or to come back to this idea that it's important to pay attention to all these different types of uh, political violence that we can experience, right? So if we, uh, you know, consider that the scenario of uh, civil war is very unlikely in the United States. Um, it's important to pay attention to all these different variants that could uh, lead to political violence in the country, like acts of terrorism, riots, uh, shootings, uh, crowd violence, uh, even like uh, in some circumstances, um, violence perpetrated by state security forces. And that's probably what we should be monitoring and uh, trying to understand in the context of the United States. So yeah. Joseph Thomas had mentioned you in particular here, if you have thoughts. Uh, just that I, I, what everybody said was has been great so far. I, I would just say that uh, similar to one of the things Thomas was saying is that political violence is, is a lot of different things and it can be sort of on a, on a big spectrum and you don't necessarily have to do a lower thing to do a bigger thing. Right. Um, and so in the U.S., you know, it's more likely, like I said, that we're, we're some of these uh, anti-state actors are going to use terrorism or some other tool and unlikely to get up to the point w which we would call terrorism or uh, civil war. The Ottawa trucker thing is interesting because I, I got in a big Twitter war <laughs> with people on this exact question because there were a bunch of people in Canada who were saying that they're using terms like they're they're violent actors and all these sorts of things. And I just said. You know, it sounds like they're occupying Ottawa, being disruptive, being annoying. That happened in D.C. when we had Occupy Wall Street um, and people got really upset about that. Um, and the point that I was trying to make is that, you know, political violence is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. If it's someone you don't like, you say it's political violence. Um, now, one of the things I learned from watching a lot of reporting and stuff was the, the truckers were harassing people and doing sort of nasty things. Some, some of the things that maybe weren't going on in the, in the Occupy Wall Street, but they were doing similar things like occupying space illegally, doing direct actions, um, you know, and so you, I don't consider those things necessarily political violence, but I think some of what they were doing was kind of going in that direction. Now that's low level. That's not in the, in like a civil war space. Um, but it is those, those kinds of contention, as Thomas was saying, could build up. And especially I would argue those things build up oftentimes when the state responds really aggressively. So, so Thomas, it sounds like one of the things that is, I, I'm sort of seeing as a through line here is that, 
despite the fact that the United States has these political tensions, that there are so many Americans that possess firearms, that there is you know, this broad gulf in partisanship in particular that's driving a lot of, uh, a lot of anger back and forth. Beyond January 6th, it sounds as though when we talk about political violence, we really don't see a lot of the more severe manifestations of political violence in the United States. I, I, we certainly, January 6th, understandably got a lot of attention, but we don't hear about the Boogaloo boys, you know, raiding Marine outposts. We don't hear about the Oath Keepers doing things. I mean, the, most Americans probably hadn't heard of the Oath Keepers prior to January 6th. Is that, am I being overly optimistic or do you think it's a fair assessment that we, that we perhaps are overstating what we have seen so far, although of course that doesn't tell us much about the future. So we're not, you know, I would say this, like we're not Argentina in like the seventies, right. right? With hyperinflation and, you know, terrorism and state repression and dirty war tactics, right? But we're also not Sweden, right? So it's like, and this is the big debate is where in that spectrum um, do you put us, right? And, you know, I think, I think that's like, you know, that's a massive gulf. And I think that's where there's a ton of uncertainty because like, you know, there's one part of me that's like, you know, the, the glass half full is that, you know what, these are the growing pains of the US becoming a multiracial democracy. And then there's the other side that's like, well, this is, you know, actually the beginning of, you know, one party rule in many states and that we actually have to be really concerned about what's happening at the local level and that, you know, the concerning, you know, who's, you know, replacing, you know, some of the more moderate Republicans who are retiring. It's not, you know, log cabin Republicans. It's not, you know, the old, you know, New England Republicans. It's people who are much more hard line. Right. right. So I, I, I don't have a, a good answer on, on that, but I think that's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things, right? I mean, if you were back in, you know, 2008, when Obama was elected, you were like Obama coalition in perpetuity. I don't think anybody really saw Trump coming as a serious political force. And so I think there's just a ton of uncertainty. And so you're going to ask, you know, us as social scientists to do the thing that we hate to do, which is make a prediction about the future. And I'm going to punt on that. Well, to be to be fair, I did not name the panel, so we so we sort of established this this as being the thing we we're going to be discussing here. Um, so uh, uh, that said, um, there has been a uh, a lot of assumptions that have been made about what political violence looks moving forward. I don't want to jump to to the end, uh, you know, too prematurely here. But what what should we anticipate? I mean, obviously, we'll have in twenty twenty four. Thomas, you you pointed out earlier that that, you know, ideally the coronavirus pandemic will have been, you know, almost entirely an afterthought by that point, knock on wood, everybody. Uh, but, you know, by 2024, we may have Donald Trump in the mix again, running for president. Uh, you know, as a member of the media, we're going to have to figure out what does it mean to have someone who advocated for, you know, overthrowing the election results run for president again? How do we cover that? But more broadly, what does it mean? Like, what does that augur for political violence in the United States? Having someone who is even prior to his first election, advocated explicitly for uh, violence at his rallies and things along those lines. What does that mean? What 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 might we expect? What lessons have we learned to suggest what we will see in 2024 if he is the nominee of the Republican Party? Uh, Joseph. Ooh, ooh, I I don't I I hope it doesn't happen <laughs> at some level. Although uh, I should say, uh, in fairness, he's pretty incompetent. And so I think we could actually have worse. Um, he's opened the box to a kind of populism, anti-institutionalism that I think could be more effectively done by someone else. I think Ron DeSantis is a good example. Um, and so, you know, in some ways I, I worry about that, but I also worry about a, a variant that's worse. Um, I mean, the best prediction of, of tomorrow is today. And I think, you know, I think there'd be a lot of more incivility and sorts of spates of, of, you know, there were all kinds of things people you saw on YouTube saying hateful things to each other or being really uh, disrespectful to each other. But I don't think I would expect something massively different than what we've seen, um, you know, during the Trump era. Anyone else have thoughts? This is this is the question, the future of political violence. Shana, what 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 do you expect over the course of the next two to three years? Sort of status quo? Um, do you do you, do you expect something to, to trigger something more significant? Well, I do think it really depends on how much purchase Trump gets in the race, right? Mm -hmm. So I I am of the mind that he's gonna try and run again. He's the he would be the front runner for the Republican nomination. Um and if 
the media treats him like a normal candidate, um, then, you know, the big lie will just continue, right? I, I mean, one thing that I, has been, I think, helpful in the last, you know, six months or so is that I've seen a lot of media outlets be very clear, right? Like there's no evidence for the big lie. There's, you know, we have no sense that the, the election was stolen. And I think that's been very helpful. But at the same time, right, all of the grievances that kind of Trump voters had, and again, Trump voters are not the same as Republican voters, right? So like his hardline, you know, um, voters who came into politics because of him, I think they still have the same grievances about um, a changing society, demographic change, um, ch globalization, the kind of change in the economy that has uh, disrupted a lot of um, industries. So I think a lot of those, grievan those grievances are still there and he still is able to pick up on them. And if we see that advocation for, we, we see him advocating violence or at least you know, he never advocates it, right? It's always like, well, if you did it, it would be okay kind of thing without any pushback from other people in the Republican party. Then I, I, I do think we might see maybe more, somewhat more than what Joe is suggesting. I certainly, I think we would see that kind of incivility coming back and um, polarization isn't going to get any better. We might see low levels of kind of you know, protests that with armed people, right? We, you know, we see, we saw that during the pandemic, those kinds of, um, you know, plots to, to kidnap uh, Gretchen Weimer, right? So, I mean, those kinds of things, I think probably would be more common if you see Trump running as a front runner than if not. Um, but I don't think, you know, I think without that kind of leadership, and it doesn't have to be Trump, right? Without that kind of leadership, I think we just kind of have this kind of society trying to figure itself out, which, which again, isn't easy, but might be um, less violent. Thomas, Joseph, thoughts on this? I, say, I wanted to just say one thing, because um, I know, Philip, you're also writing a book on this, and I know my parents are listening. So I'm gonna just say, that I also think kind of one of the things that has sort of been tamped down in, you know, cleavages in politics, but, you know, if I'm going to make a prediction, I think it's going to be a much bigger cleavage going forward is the gap between baby boomers and everybody else. I mean, I think that's, you know, been hidden by the fact that we had Joe Biden, right, an older person running and the Democratic Party leadership is all older. I think you know, given the preferences of baby boomers across climate change, all these other things versus especially Gen Z and millennials. And as those folks get, you know, I'm an elder millennial as we start to get into our prime voting years, I think that's going to be a really big conflict going forward because the preferences of those two groups, I think, are, uh, you know, opposed on a lot of issues. And also, the composition of millennials are, and Gen Z are way more diverse and they care about, you know, different issues. And so I, I think, you know, you know, if I were to make one prediction, I would say in the next four to 10 years, buckle your seatbelt for generation warfare. I have, I have an enormous number of thoughts on that, which I will not share right now, but yes, Joseph. Uh, I, I think Shana made a really good point talking about, I've been hard on Trump. Uh, but I want to be less hard on his voters in the sense of um, it's really true that the world's changing and they've lost. And there have been people who've really, uh, you know, were in situations that were much more sort of efficacious and powerful and, and they're, they're not in those same situations. And so there are grievances that are unresolved and Trump just was very good at, uh, at harnessing them. I think and unless we just want to live with political violence and we don't really want to try and mitigate it, I think we have to listen to some of those grievances and try and, you know, ameliorate them or at least manage them some way uh, and not pretend that they don't exist. Uh, and so, you know, that that's, I think, a hard thing to do, especially when we feel like what they're saying is accurate. Um, but, you know, this, this is something that I'm uh, yeah, and I, I was talking about polarization earlier that that's really frustrating. But I, I know personally from um, my family is that this these last five years have been polarizing both across the country but internally and there are times where our families get together and we don't talk about any of these things or we don't get together uh and that's something i think that's totally different and unique and it's that 
um, I think people are aligning themselves more with their political views and less uh, interacting with people who have who they love pro probably, but don't share the same political views. And so you're not getting exposed to those views and you're not having those cross um, group dialogues. And that's that's troubling to me. And I think also potentially violence inducing. It's actually a good segue to, to my next question. So Omar, I'd ask you, if you were advising the federal government, if you were advising the FBI, local law enforcement, what they should watch out for, what they could do, I shouldn't say local law enforcement, because it's not really a, a law enforcement job to try and be preventative in this way. But if you were advising the federal government writ large on how to try and avoid or tamp down on some of the the causes of political violence over the course of the next 10 years or so, what would you say? What, what advice would you give them? What could we be doing differently in order to make this less likely to happen? Omar, sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Um, that would be a very hard job to do, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would say that we probably, I would start by paying attention to uh, some reforms that might be necessary uh, to have a more functional democracy in the United States. Like, uh, for example, uh, thinking of all the issues that emerge from gerrymandering, from the Electoral College. Um, I think that uh, the last presidential election, <clears throat> the level of mistrust in the electoral process expressed by many American voters uh, was very high. And I think, uh, I, I believe that the elections are fair and transparent uh, in this country, but I can see how for a significant amount of voters, the way the elections are organized uh, generates a lot of suspicion if they see, uh, you know, if they, you know, see or pay attention to all these conspiracy theories that are emerging. Um, I look at this from, as, to some extent, as as, um, as an outsider who grew up in a, an authoritarian regime where nobody trusted elections for uh, seventy years until we created an autonomous institution, an independent institution um, in charge of organizing elections in Mexico, right? And so when I see the way elections are organized in the United States, my immediate reaction is like. This wouldn't work in Mexico at all. People wouldn't trust the way elections, the level of um, you know, uh, decentralization that exists in the organization of elections in this country. It's, it's really uh, uh, shocking to me as, as, a, as a Mexican who grew up in a, uh, in a country with uh, a lot of mistrust in elections. But I do believe that the uh, elections are fair and transparent. And, but I, I believe that there are uh, reforms that need uh, to be implemented in order to uh, increase not only uh, a more trust uh, in the electoral processes for a number of voters, but also uh, to have fair access uh, to of representation. Uh, and in this specific case, I think uh, the long-standing debates on gerrymandering and the electoral co college are probably uh, necessary steps to try to rectify some of the uh, patterns of exclusion in terms of rep representation for large parts of the electorate in, in the country. Um, and in addition to that, um, we could probably think of uh, reforming uh, pol the police or um, and more broadly on establishing systems of uh, or mechanisms to monitor uh, more effectively uh, what we were talking, what we've been talking about, the multiple uh, types of political violence that could emerge uh, during the following two years. And just the last thing that I just wanted to mention is that to some extent, it's going to be very uh, important to see what, how the, uh, the Democrats respond to, to this, right? Because all these grievances that uh, we uh, were mentioning uh, I agree that um, the, many of them are legitimate and uh, the Democrats have uh, some homework to do in this sense because all of those have been pretty much capitalized by, uh, by the conservative, uh, by, by the Republican party and, and by Trump very, very effectively. 
So in that sense, it's going to be interesting to see how the uh, Democrats respond during the next two years. And I would also expect a lot of um, mobilizations uh, against Trump. And I don't know how, would, how that is going to affect uh, the potential for uh, conflict and more violence in the country. It, it's an interesting, you raise an interesting point about elections in particular, one that I think has a has an interesting and very salient issue that has just emerged, or rather a, a new iteration of it's just emerged. And so Shane, I, I'd ask, I'd, I'd direct this to you, but we saw today in Wisconsin that there is this special counsel that's been appointed by the state Senate who came back and said that there was rampant fraud in, in Wisconsin in the 2020 election, something we know to be not the case. And in fact, the report he, he provided was just utter nonsense. I, I happen to have read it wrong before this. Uh, but it's a reminder that there is a political reward system in place for amplifying some of these underlying patterns, right? The reason that Donald Trump acts the way he does is in part because that's who Donald Trump is, but it's also because he understands that the base reacts positively to that. Wisconsin legislators understand that they get more traction with Republican voters by amplifying Trump's false claims than they do by challenging them. I mean, even Trump's claims about Vladimir Putin have gone mostly unchallenged by his party because there's no reward within the Republican Party for standing up to him on those claims. And so, you know, I, I had asked Omar, how do we get the federal government to take actions which can minimize uh, political violence, which I'd like to hear you know, the, the other panelists' thoughts as well. But Sheena, what do we do with this reward mechanism that itself is broken in the way that it rewards giving the base what they want, as opposed to necessarily the things which are either true or can prevent some of the worst case scenarios from, from evolving? Oh, no, so it's just a small question, right? Sure. Just like <laughs> sure. not, nothing big. Yeah, you have two minutes. Uh, Let's go. Um, okay. So one of the things I think is is difficult about so to go back to these kind of real grievances that voters have is that um, I think often what happens is the easy we we give voters or at least politicians give voters the easy answer rather than the true answer, which is right. Coal is a dying industry. Your, you know, your, it, your jobs are not coming back. We need to think about how we, you know, do the hard thing um, and retrain you. And, and because that is not the answer that people want to hear. They want to hear, right? It's not your fault that things are hard right now. It's someone else's fault and, you know, and I can fix it for you. Um, and so I think part of this is that there has to be, um, there at least has to be some, party out there that is willing to um, listen to people's grievances and tell them the truth, but also provide solutions, right? So it's not enough to just recognize people's grievances. You have to provide them solutions that, that, um, that are for them, that they, that they feel like you've listened to them. And I think part of the answer to the question of how we tamp down on political violence, I agree with all the institutional issues is, but is also on a the kind of grassroots level is to listen to voters and to make them feel like part of the process and make them feel heard. And so I, I don't know how to solve the issue of, you know, people want to hear the untruth, except to say that we need to like actually tell the, you know, the media, other elites, people and in interest groups, they need to be um, countering those messages and telling the truth. Um, so that at least there is some sense that we can, like that untruths don't sit out there unchallenged. Um, the kind of institutional problems at the state level are, I think, a little bit um, easier to solve than at the federal level, but, but I do think they are more of a challenge, right? So how do you get Wisconsin to stop gerrymandering when there's all of the benefits to the Republican Party to keep you know, the seats that they have. Um, I think what you're seeing now is Democrats doing the same thing in places like New York and in New Jersey, that they are just learning how to not make this game asymmetrical so that they are now countering. Um, I don't think that's a violence a question about violence. I think that's a, like the Democrats can't just give up the game when it comes to strategies about keeping power. I think that is the kind of telling the truth, um, making sure that you're countering mistruths and also listening to people, I think is part of this. But, the, but you know, there is this part of the kind of 
at least the right wing ecosystem and the information system that is built on the idea that the mainstream doesn't tell you the truth and like you should only turn to us for information. And that is harder for me to figure out how you counter that um, because there's both like a there's a power that comes from that, but also that that's wrapped up in the economics of that that media system. Yeah, I mean, so I don't I, have a good answer. Is what is the <laughs> right? No, that, I don't think anyone does. Right? Yeah, I mean, and to your last point, I mean, I, I you know, as a writer for the Washington Post, I can certainly attest that. And I think one of the things we're also seeing is we're seeing the same sort of. Uh, you know, particularly in the Biden era, we're seeing on the left as well, the sort of emergence of these same sorts of the media are doing wrong by you in the same way that we've seen on the right for a much longer time. So, it, it, you know, another way in which that, that balance is sort of being redistributed. Um, so, Thomas, I'd be, well, before we get to the questions from, from folks who are watching, I, I wanted to ask you and, and Joseph one last question here, which is what we who are watching this, who are not necessarily experts, what might we do? What, 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 what can a normal American do to try and keep political violence from erupting? Is there anything we can do? Is it totally outside of our control? Or are there changes that Americans ought to make in order to, to, to strengthen uh, you know, the, 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 the sense of America to some extent? You, you want me to go first? Is that what you're pointing at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's hard, but I think we have to be up for a reasonable dialogue with folks that don't agree with us. And I've made it a rule that I, and I, this is a little bit of a luxury because I don't, I'm never sexually harassed, but I make it a rule to not um, block people on Twitter or Facebook or anything else. When, and when people disagree with me, I try and engage them and have an honest dialogue and try and listen um, and listen to their points and model appropriate sort of behaviors that I would like someone to treat me when I disagree with them. Um, and I, I think we need to do that more with the other side. And I don't think we're doing a good job of it. I think we are, you know, we're living in the same towns, in the same neighborhoods with everybody that agrees with us. And we're, you know, um, going to the same churches where everybody agrees with us. And so I think as everyday normal Americans, I would reach out to someone who really disagrees with me and try and, and engage in a reasonable dialogue with obviously the caveat that there are some people that are are going to be inappropriate and awful and and like i was saying i that that may not affect me but if it affects you i'm not suggesting doing that um you know and i mean there's something that has been thrown out there which i love as a general idea is i i would like uh us to have a year of national service where people have to spend a year after like a gap year after high school doing working in a national park doing the peace corps whatever it is uh, where they have to engage with other people that aren't like them and they have to have these sorts of reasonable interactions. And so ultimately we can sort of develop a better civic connection engagement and not, not sort of just hang with the people that are like us. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I mean, this is like such a thorny issue, like so give us the solution to American democracy in a, a snappy soundbite. And I think, you know, it's really hard. I think the solution like that everybody recognizes, but it's probably the most the hardest to do is, is, you know, we have to figure out a way to basically make it so that elections are not purely zero sum. The problem is that's our system. Right. And so most of the reforms that have been talked about. Right. And, you know, proportional representation or, you know, their ranked choice voting has a little bit of a sketchy history somewhat and, you know, their alkalites, et cetera, right? Is the, the question is, is how can we get elites to be okay, one with losing election or sharing power? And that's a really hard thing to think about, um, you know, because I think that's like, if you look, you know, in, I'll go on my like pessimistic take, right? If you look at, you know, the people who propped up Trump and, you know, Jerry Falwell had this tweet, it was, you know, we need to stop electing, you know, Republican wimps because, you know, the liberal fascist Dems are playing for keeps. We need street fighters like real Donald Trump. Right. If that's the, you know, that and that got, you know, a ton of play. Right. And that's if that's the MO for how you view elections, that's a really bad place. So you need to figure out how to keep that in check. Right. So what can ordinary Americans do for that? I think, you know, one is be ready to mobilize when there are elites you know, who are doing such a, these things and also supporting people who you may not agree with, but are also willing to uphold the standards of democracy. I think that's like one of the, the basic things, you know, at the grassroots level, um, I think, you know, I, I completely agree with, with what Joe said, right? And I'll tell like a very quick anecdote is I was talking to an environmental activist in the Midwest and, 
this person was pretty radical, right? Comes from a very radical background, was like really into direct action, et cetera. And he said, you know, that he wanted to get a coal fire power plant closed. And him and his people, they thought, and they were like, you know, we go chain ourselves to the coal power plant, right? Get arrested for civil disobedience and nothing would happen. And we'd be labeled radicals and we couldn't organize anything. Or what they ended up doing is they talked to local union people. They talked to met with local politicians. It took like a year and a half of organizing, but they ended up taking the power, coal-fired power plant offline six years earlier, right? And so that's the thing is, are you willing to talk to people who don't agree with you, willing to make those kinds of grassroots campaigns? And I think that's, you know, you know, the final point I also said is like, stop nationalizing politics, which is a tricky thing to do, but I think that's like an important uh, point, part of it. So I'll put a little plug is the way that you stop nationalizing politics is to actually open local newspapers, right? So like we've had a death of local newspapers in the in the past several decades, which leads to this kind of what do we know about politics is all written by the Washington Post, which I have a subscription to. Not but um, <laughs> that's my local newspaper. <laughs> right. No, yeah, fair enough. But like, but this is one of these these things that actually, you know, if people know more about their local issues and can engage more, where do they learn about that? They learn about that from their local news um, station and their local newspaper. And actually, I do think that um, the consolidation and death of local newspapers is part of the problem of polarization um, and that um, it's exciting to see some of the foundations that are now trying to open nonprofit newspapers, but it's not, it's not replacing what we've lost in, in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to transition. I don't want to take the last word here, but I'd also say the same thing, local television stations, which are also now giant things along arts as well. Um, so, but I do want to transition to questions from the audience and we have a number here. Um, and so uh, let's jump into them. So a, a good one here at the top, which is very specific, but gets it a lot, it gets it a really interesting question uh, in doing so. And, and so we'll start with you, Joseph. The question is with the appropriate security, shouldn't the January 6th riot have been halted in five minutes? And it's, it's, a, it's a very pointed question. And I think a lot of us recognize that the way the Capitol was overrun was a, was volume, that there were thousands and thousands of people pushing forward. But it speaks to a number of different issues. Why was there not sufficient preparation? Why, you know, how can we be more prepared for things in the future? But isn't it also the case that political violence is a function of the capacity to have it happen? That, that, that it is, it is, there is a failure that takes place in order for political violence to happen. So Joseph, I realize that's a number of things sort of brought together, but what's your what's your assessment of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the questioner is onto something in that it should have been able to be put down very quickly. Um, I I really don't think that the organizers and and a lot of us didn't think that that was going to happen, and so mm -hmm. I think it was it was just it was not expected, um, you know. And and there are all sorts of crowd control ways that you can kind of mitigate those types of violent riots, um, but you know, and there's been a lot of discussions too. What do we call January 6th? I mean, one one thing to call it was a violent riot, right? People mm -hmm. got excited and, and it sort of, and like Thomas was talking about, there are lots of different kinds of people there, but probably the average person was super hopped up, had just heard a really exciting speech and started marching and then saw barricades coming down. It was like, all right, this looks fun. Um, and, you know, that that's not the Oath Keepers or those kinds of guys, but, um, you know, so that sort of violent riot should be able to be put down fairly quickly. I just don't think the authorities were prepared for it. And I mean, I don't know, you, you've probably been down to the Capitol lately, and I think the Capitol is built up right now in that same sort of way um, that it couldn't, the way it is right now, there's no way it would have happened. Right. It's just, I, I mean, part of it is, I don't think people in, um, you know, in our liberal democracy like to see the Capitol like that. Um, I would, you know, I've been to other capital cities around the world, and you, it's, it's much different sometimes and then sometimes it's much more open but in in a um you know in a democracy like ours it's it's jarring when you see big fences and wires and um so yeah right but but i mean also omar this also the question speaks to the lack of foresight and, and you know at the the first question i asked was who had some sense that january 6 was going to happen and, and no one said well i you know, I, I anticipated this happening. Obviously, even though federal officials were tracking what was happening, they didn't foresee it either. So what does that tell us? Does it tell us nothing? Or do we look at this as a one-off event? Does this suggest that, you know, obviously part of that, I think, is, is the America's sense that these sorts of things don't happen in America, which I think it, we're, we're now fully disabused of. But does, does, does that not also tell us something that no one actually saw this coming? 
I was very surprised, to be honest, um, that this happened, but also was very surprised that uh, apparently uh, they were not prepared for this when you would expect that uh, people in charge of this were monitoring very, very closely uh, what was going on in the previous days. Um, but there was an element of surprise to some extent, uh, and that's probably what um, uh, what happened that day. Like uh, I think Trump, uh, at the end of the day, really uh, contributed or incited uh, violence uh, on January sixth, and and I don't know uh, to what extent like the lack of preparedness can also be attributed to uh, some internal. Uh, decision making uh, in which uh, the president also uh, uh, took a role. Um, but I think we could say it, it was a major failure of security, you know, like for a country like the United States to see this thing happening in the capital uh, is certainly a, a major, uh, major failure in terms of, of security. So that, that it's a good transition to another question that someone had, which was what role accountability plays here. So one of the things that the January 6th committee on the House side is doing, obviously, is trying to figure out what led to this and, and, and how this, you know, what, what the contributing factors were and who might be held to account. We have obviously already seen President Trump escape accountability. He was impeached, but not uh, convicted by the Senate shortly after uh, the events of January 6th. But is this something, Thomas, that we've seen in other circumstances where people you know, beyond like the classic, you know, Adolf Hitler example, where there a lack of accountability then plays into an exacerbation of future events of political violence. Yeah, I mean, I think Joe and, and Omar and others, like, I mean, I think like the actual threat to the U.S. like seat of power, right, was, you know, minimal, right? Like, I think the right. capital, in the sense, like the, like the fact that they were going to violently overthrow the U.S. government, which is what they were, many, some of the people, the hardcore members were trying to do. I mean, there was, right. we know it was an insurrection. And I think there's a lot of debate about whether or not this was an auto gold pay or self coup, whether like Trump, ex and we're, I think we will probably find some of that out, you know, and maybe we'll find that out in those papers that, you know, mysteriously headed to Florida and got back. But I think the thing that, you know, you started with about like, you know, the definition of democracy is like parties agree to lose, right? There's a lot of kind of, you know, symbolism inherent in democracy. And when you see, you know, violence at the Capitol, right? I mean, that's, I think kind of, that was like, to me, the bigger thing. And you, I had so many, you know, people who, you know, I'm friends with and colleagues outside the US. I mean, my friends who were in Ukraine who were like, you know, this, you know, is looks worse than what happened in Euromaidan in some ways, you know, what is happening, you know, in the US. And I think that's the other thing, too, is that, you know, I would say as much as it's, you know, hasn't, you know, the kind of lack of accountability has, you know, played into the fact, I think you look at all the articles that happened after January 6th, and people are like, Trump is done, you know, his moment has passed, and we've seen that that hasn't happened. He hasn't been purged. And I think this is the big question mark, you know, coming back to elites, right, is there are conservative parties that have had threats, right, from the right before, like throughout history in Europe and interwar Europe and Latin America. And there is a question, right, are they willing to expel the anti-democratic impulses of, the, of some of the people on their violent, you know, radical flank? And the Republican Party, the answer is, I would say, it's a question mark and probably not right now, which is, I think is actually probably the scariest part of where U.S. democracy is now. That's the most pessimistic part to me, right, is that you can't purge someone. And, you know, in Germany, like, you know, my colleagues, like, he would be banned from running for office. This, that would be the end of it. Right. And instead, he's the presumable leader in 2024. So another question here that gets at uh, somewhat, uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say more esoteric aspect of this, but um, the question of faith. So one of the things that we saw was a common thread, obviously, with supporters of President Trump, who had enormous support from the white evangelical Protestant uh, community, for example. Uh, and there were, you know, uh, manifestations of faith at January 6th. But the question is, does faith play a role here? Is there is there an exacerbating factor that is played by faith uh, when we talk about political violence? Um, Shana. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to rely a little bit on Lily Mason's work. Lily is at uh, Johns Hopkins and has a book about polarization. And her argument is that partisanship is now a social identity that lines up with lots of other identities, including um, kind of religion um, in ways that it it didn't in earlier eras when we had less polarization. And so part of the argument that she makes is now that the parties have sorted, right? So white evangelicals are now much more heavily in the Republican party, that is bound up, the Republicanness and the evangelicalism are bound up together. And I should be very clear that's white evangelicals. Um, um, and so th those two things are bound up with other kinds of social identities. And so um, th they are used to reinforce each other and, and reinforce the ways that, and, and they, they focus the way we, we perceive politics and not just on the on the right but also on the left right the kind of other identities that we have are all kind of aligned now which is part of the reason that polarization is difficult um, because we have so few cross-cutting cleavages at this point and so I do think this idea that kind of there we certainly saw these kind of images of um, of crosses and Christian nationalism at January 6 I think that's a very troubling but very particular part of the Republican Party. I think there are lots of people of faith, of lots of faiths who, um, who fall all over the political spectrum. Um, but I do think this kind of bounding up of what it means to be a Republican and being evangelical together are particularly potent. And we saw that a lot in the symbolism of January 6th. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. And this is one of the roles that faith leaders have is to, um, because they have this audience of people um, that they can, they can talk in their, in, in their sermons and in their social justice work about, in, in the ways that Joe is talking about and Thomas is talking about, about having conversations across lines of difference, right? Part of what, what faith leaders can do is talk about the importance of dialogue and listening, um, and it, again, it doesn't have to be that white evangelicals are Republicans and that they you know, dislike Democrats. These things don't have to go together. There are roles for kind of social leaders in, in faith communities and outside to also um, tamp down on some of the polarization. Can I just say one one quick thing is right, and I think there was you know you know Bill Barr has his book come out, and like I think a lot of people were puzzled by like how did that you know Bill Barr end up in the Trump administration? But I think one of the things again is you know the appeal of Trump, this bombastic figure who doesn't you know uphold many of the values that many of the folks who you know particularly white evangelicals espouse about you know faith etc. But right this view and you know. Barr gave a speech in October of 2019, basically saying that, you know, the religious concern, you know, and conservatives are under assault by progressives and basically through savage social media campaigns, Barr say. And so in essence, right, that justifies kind of a hardball style of politics. And I think that's the, you know, again, this goes back to the more concerning aspects of what we've talked about today. If that's your worldview, that's, you know, then, you know, democratic elections, you know, maybe don't mean as much to you as just pure winning. And of course, Barr also had an enormous amount of faith in the power of the executive as opposed to the legislative. But um, uh, one last question here before we go, and it's a question that's very, fairly specific. Uh, the question is whether there have been indications that we might see electoral violence uh, coming up either in the midterms or in 2024. And I, I'm reading the question, the thing that strikes me is that we don't really see that very often. We saw, you know, we certainly saw in 2008, there was an effort to sort of raise the specter of there having been electoral violence, this whole thing with the new Black Panther Party that was amplified on Fox News repeatedly uh, as being sort of, the, you know, the, the, the effort to try and scare people at the polls. We have certainly seen some intimidating things there. But the question is, is this something that we might anticipate, that we might anticipate the use of political violence as a way to deter people from voting? Is that something we've seen? Is it something we might have to worry about seeing? Uh, Joseph. Uh, I mean, we've definitely seen it in other places around the world, sure. and there's lots, lots of papers that uh, too many to count, really, that suggest around elections, you see a ramp up in violence. Um, it hasn't really been part of the American spirit, uh, at least not in modern times. Um, and so I, 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 
I don't know. I don't know if it, you know, if it is something that we should worry about. I, I, I guess I worry about more of these really um, uncivil behaviors that then escalate uh, as, as in, in where, you know, in some of, you know, let's say you have uh, a lot of this violence is also kind of intertwined with ethnicity uh, in other countries. And so I worry a little less about that kind of violence, but um, yeah, it, I do worry that, that it could, these sort of bad behavior escalates. Good. Uh, I, I think that's all the questions we have from folks. Uh, yeah, I did, we just want to say thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to everyone uh, who has been tuning in here. We'll uh, give you another four minutes to get ready for the State of the Union address here, which will be far less compelling, I'm sure. Uh, but I hope this conversation has been useful to you and informative uh, and uh, appreciate your tuning in. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.